A lot of people think that injecting CO2 into their aquarium can be risky, dangerous for their fish, and complicated, and it can be, if you don't know this. Done right, it could be the biggest benefit for your tank and safe for your fish. So because this is a little bit of a complex subject, I'm going to break this up into about three videos. In this first video, we're going to go over why you want CO2 in your aquarium. Number two, what are the different ways you can get CO2 into your aquarium? And three, all the different components and parts so you understand how to set up your system. So why would you want CO2 in your tank? Well, plants are mostly made up of carbon and it is an essential part for photosynthesis, which generates the sugars, which makes the plants grow, right? This is all basic stuff that we learned in high school. The problem is that in your aquarium, there isn't a lot of CO2. So that's really the limiting factor to their growth. So by us adding more CO2, we can have bigger, healthier, more lush plants and healthier plants are resistant to algae. So they really help keep the algae under control and because they are growing so fast and rapidly compared to without it, they really are gonna use up all that light and all that extra fertilizer that we're gonna put in there. So it allows you to raise the level of everything and the balance of that trifecta being CO2, light, and fertilization. Another thing is that you can keep plants that normally wouldn't survive in your tank unless they were CO2 injected. Some plants require just a little bit more, some require a decent amount more. With CO2, there's a lot of plants that wouldn't normally not survive, but now we can have very beautiful results. How do you go about picking the right CO2 for you? Now you're gonna see a couple different ways this is done. And the first one we're gonna talk about is the DIY or the homemade solution where it's yeast and sugar mixed together. And then that is put into the tank through a diffuser usually. And that is 24 hours a day, nonstop. There's no controlling this reaction. The problem is it's very inconsistent delivery, isn't very, un is, isn't very sightly. And really my issue is that there's no way to really know if we're doing too much or too little. The second one, and you've probably seen this one around, is what I call a generator, which you'll see on Amazon. And I've had them myself, which are uh, citric acid and baking soda combined in a cylinder that generates pressure. It does have an electric solenoid, so we can use a timer to turn it on and off and more about that later. But the problem is it's very inconsistent in its delivery because the pressure of the tank is always waning off as it's being used. That inconsistent delivery is making you always fuss with it. And that is part of the problem that you have with those is that making that constant adjustment to keep it at a stable level. The third one is what we call a pressurized CO2 system, and they come two ways. There are disposable units where you can buy a disposable canister that goes on or refillable. On my case, I use a refillable cylinder. You can get that from a welding supply or a beverage supply store like that does homemade beer and stuff like that, where they'll sell you a cylinder and a lot of them do refilling also. So going forward for the rest of these videos, we're gonna be talking about the pressurized system as it is the most consistent and the most reliable. And when it comes to your aquarium, stability is the key to everything. And you've heard me say it before and you'll see that going forward in this, but a pressurized system, yet it be a disposable or a refillable tank will be the focus of the videos going forward. So the common components that you're gonna need for everything is obviously is one, the cylinder that stores liquid CO2 in it. And it's a high pressure cylinder. So we do need to treat it with respect and make sure it's in a safe place where it won't get knocked over. Sizing of the bottle is kind of important. For me, I went out and bought a 20 pound bottle. This is for a 40 breeder. And this 20 pound bottle right here is a little bit too tall for this 40 breeder cabinet. I really should have measured it first and I recommend you do too. I can get a little more than a year out of a bottle. So a 10 pound probably would have been fine and maybe get a year or just under out of a bottle, which is very nice. And I have to think about always replacing it. Measure the total height of your cabinet and give you a little extra room because that regulator and bubble counter is gonna make it stick up a little bit more and give you that extra space and see what fits for you. In my case, I just mounted it outside the cabinet and it was no problem. The second component is the regulator. Now you're gonna see regulators in a different, few different ways based on price. You're gonna see probably a single stage regulator, which is the cheaper of the two, and then a dual stage regulator. The difference between the two of them is that a dual stage regulator doesn't experience what is known as end tank dump. The regulator and the way it works is using the bottle pressure and then stepping it down to the using pressure, usable pressure. And there's two stages to that regulator. 
in a single stage regulator, when that bottle pressure drops very low, the, regular ca the regulator can't maintain a stability between the two and it balances out and dumps the contents of the bottle into your tank and this could kill all your fish. So for safety reasons, I always recommend a dual stage regulator. Now for this guide, I'm not going into brands or anything. There's plenty of great stuff out there. Everything that you're seeing and the pictures that you're seeing of my stuff, that regulator is actually no longer made and I've had great success with it, even though others said they've had problems. In my experience, just go with a brand that stands behind their product and being that it is probably one of the more expensive components in this, you don't want to cut corners here. Now that regulator is going to have the electric solenoid built into it. And what this does is this allows us to turn the CO2 on and off with the light. I'm going to recommend that you have your CO2 go on a minimum of one hour before the light and mine turns off with it. Some people will turn it off an hour earlier and we'll go into tuning that in the next video. But for now, let's just say, on an hour before the lights come on and turn off with the lights. After the solenoid, you're gonna use a bubble counter, which is basically a little chamber that has a needle valve below it. And that'll let you adjust how much flow that is going into the aquarium when the CO2 is on by counting bubbles per second or BPS as you'll see online. For me, I'm between four and six on this tank. And the next thing you want to make sure it comes with is CO2 rated hose. Now, plenty of people will tell you you can use any hose you want and it will transport it, but you want hose that isn't going to give off CO2 and leak it through there and also retain it and be able to operate at the pressures. So a quality hose, and it's not much more money at all. And a lot of the kits that you'll buy will come with it, but a CO2 rated hose is definitely recommended. A stainless steel check valve opposed to the plastic ones that we use for air pumps is what I recommend to use. And I put it right near the top rim of the tank, right before it goes down into the diffuser. This will stop the water from backing up and possibly damaging any, any component, ultimately keeping pressure in the line so that it doesn't have to build up the pressure every time it turns on. The diffuser is how the CO2 is delivered into the tank. And there are a couple different ways, and we're just gonna go over them really briefly. The first and most common is a ceramic disc diffuser that you'll see where it makes a very fine mist of bubbles, which increases the surface area. We want super fine bubbles that stay in the water as long as possible to give them a chance to dissolve. The next one is a inline diffuser. If you have a canister, this would go in the return line to the tank and this puts the CO2 in there, gives it some extra time to dissolve and is distributed around the tank with the flow. This is good for bigger tanks and is definitely recommended at say anything around this size, 40 and up. I would say an inline diffuser is probably the way to go or at least two ceramic diffusers because equal distribution of CO2 can be an issue. The third one is the most effective and removes all the bubbles from the water is called a reactor. This would go in line to the re from the return back to the tank and CO2 is injected into here and then fully dissolved before it is introduced into the tank. So with an, a reactor, there are no bubbles. So if you're looking for that super crystal clear look or you have a very, very big tank, a reactor is definitely the answer because reactors ensure 100% absorption, no loss of CO2 and equal distribution throughout the tank. So one thing, if you're going to use a ceramic disc diffuser is a location of the diffuser. You definitely want that diffuser in the downflow water. So in this tank, the outflow pipe is coming from this side and coming across. So I put my diffuser here. So as the water hits this side of the tank, the water flows down and pushes that flow down and around the front of the tank all the way across. So make sure your flow is good. And I have a video that I'll put a uh, tag up there that talks about an air pump, how you can use sponge filters of all things for added agitation plus for good flow around your tank. And the last thing you're gonna need is a drop checker at minimum. A drop checker is a tool used that will change colors based on the amount of CO2 in the tank. So when there's not enough, there's, it's blue. When there's too much, it's yellow. And when it's right, it's green. The installation of your CO2 system isn't that hard, but there's a few things you definitely should know if you're gonna set this up right. The first thing is that if you just had the bottle filled, the bottle's gonna be warm from cramming all that CO2 into the bottle. It does warm up a little bit. You wanna make sure the bottle cools down to room temperature because if you tighten up that fitting when it's warm, when it cools off, it may become loose and start to leak. 
So definitely make sure your bottle is at the same temperature as the room and you want to tighten up that regulator on there, but you don't want to over tighten it. Most of these regulators don't have any sort of fittings or crush washers. Depends on if you're using a soda stream or some people have gone as far as adapting fire extinguishers. So depending on your contact type or sorry, your connection type, put it together, dry and clean is what I always recommend. And you want it tight, but don't go crazy. One thing is when you go in to tighten that up is to hold your regulator and make sure your bubble counter stays upright. You can't have it pointing sideways or pointing to the front or the back. You want that straight up so we get a consistent bubble lift as it comes out so it's easier to count. The next thing you want to do is fill your bubble counter. Now you can use water or you can use glycerin, but it's just got to be food safe glycerin and basically that's just a little bit thicker it's easier to count and it doesn't evaporate as fast as the water i personally use the water because once i set my bubble count it's a pretty set it and forget it thing and that's why i recommend a high pressure system but there'll be more on that later like i said earlier the placement of the diffuser if you're going to use a disc type diffuser in the tank is very important and the size of the diffuser so if you're a very big tank, we want to have more bubbles. So maybe a larger diffuser for a 40, 55, 75 gallon tank, or possibly even two of them. But make sure it's in a good downflow area where you can see those bubbles get carried all the way across the tank. So when you first get it going, you want to start slow. You don't want to go in there and crank it to max and then totally overshoot and kill the fish. So start with one bubble, two bubbles per second and see what kind of change you have after about two hours. You basically need to make a change and wait a couple of hours and make a change and wait. So what I recommend is that you make a change and do a pH test, make a change and do a pH test. And I would say a minimum one hour for that CO2 adjustment to have set in to be realistic because a drop checker is a little bit slow in reacting. It could be two hours for a drop checker to react to any sort of change that you made. It's very important that you give it adequate time to dissolve the CO2 and to have a nice green color come from the drop checker. Doing it this way, you'll be fine tuning your system as it runs throughout the day to hit the optimal level. And what is that optimal level? What is a degas sample? We're going to get into that. But what if I told you there was a better way, an easier way, a safer way? In this video right here, I'm going to go over degas samples, how to set target levels, how to tune in your CO2 for the best operation. And don't worry, it's not going to get too nerdy, but it's going to get nerdier as we go on. So click this video right here and let's get you up and running.